Um, so I've put it roughly uh, under fives to under sevens, under, eight, under eights to under twelves, and under thirteens to under seventeens. Um, obviously, um, an exercise I've put in here for the under fives to under sevens would still be applicable and useful for any of the age groups above that. It's just that the under thirteens to seventeens ones wouldn't be necessarily uh, feasible for the younger age groups. Hopefully, that makes sense. So, if you're an under thirteens coach, all of these should be things that you potentially could use. Uh, so, starting off with the um, under fives to under sevens. Um, a few of these I put together, a few of these, I think, Robbie, did, was it you that put these ones together, the other ones? Mike. I'm not sure. Mike, okay. So I might need Mike to interject in a few little bits uh, if, because I, I added mine on top rather than necessarily did these, but um, what you can do to start, little five by five boxes um, and use these as little warm ups or races. I think these ones are fairly self explanatory, so I won't um, dwell too long on these ones because uh, it's quite easy to, to read through this one. Mike's made it very clear on how to do this, but you can do uh, different stretches, star jumps, press ups, blah, 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 in those uh, boxes, little races, running around the squares, um, uh, running a clockwise, anti clockwise, uh, whatever it is, and just have, have races. Um, for those ones, uh, there's a few builds in the bottom as well. Um, starting on stomach, pick up the ball um, from starting in the middle, rolling, that sort of stuff. So make it imaginative. If you want to uh, change what they do on each side of the square, then obviously you can do that as well. Um, then a little agility warm up. Um, I do this with the adults. It's quite fun. Just similarly with everything, the more you make races, the, the more they enjoy it. So you start the child player on the purple cross they start in the middle um, and uh, you've got four different colored cones and then you just shout out a, a sequence of the cones so my example here is blue red blue green so they touch the blue red blue and then the green and it's the first person to complete all four of those it's just a nice little agility warm-up um, you can do this one but just put all four um, cones as different colors and then you've got this one ready to go as well so you've got kind of two things ready to go there uh, advances, you can make the sequences longer or tougher or um, give something they've got to touch the cone with, so um, touch with a foot or hand, anything like that. Moving on, we've got a tail game. Um, you, can use, um, you can use shirts, spare shirts, bibs, anything like that. Um, but here, I just quickly play this and then you can see what's going on. You can have kind of um, Three on ones, uh, three, sorry, three on ones, three on twos, whatever, or have everyone with a tail. And the idea is that they can, um, they run around and they're trying to steal the tail off the, the kids around them. Uh, obviously sets up a little bit of agility and as soon as they steal their tail, they just give it back. Uh, kid goes to the sides, put it back in and then they carry on. Uh, the example here is slightly different where um, it's kind of, they're trying to grab as many as they can and it's the last person standing. Okay, uh, hopefully that's simple enough. That's an easy one to set up if you've got a few extra little bits like bibs or shirts. Uh, next. Um, there we go. Um, similarly, a little evasion game. Um, you have three or four attackers with a ball and one or two defenders without a ball. Um, the defenders are trying to touch, uh, touch the attackers with the ball. They can move in any direction. Um, once the defender touches attacker, they just pass the ball over to the uh, defender and then their roles are swapped over. Um, I just gave it a little bit of extra here where you've got four different, uh, sorry, three different sizes based on the colored cones. So the blue cones here are obviously small, so there's gonna be far more touches and far more turnovers. If you go for the green ones, there's gonna be far fewer touches and it's gonna be harder for the defenders to, to catch the attackers. Um, could be good, quite, it's quite a good one for the younger guys because a, it gets them passing and B, it gets them thinking about um, running away from um, defenders. Uh, sweet. Chase a chicken, I've called this. All of these things for the younger ones, obviously if you can make it animal related, they're probably going to enjoy it a little bit more. Um, the players are in pairs or threes and essentially it's a, you're trying to chase the chicken. So the chicken is the person with the ball and they are trying to evade and run away from the defenders. I've called them foxes in this case, trying to get their egg and they're just trying to run away. Same, same principle as this, but you just added in a ball basically. Um, and you can change the roles over as much or as little as you like. Um, shout pass and then just got to pass to someone else and their roles change over. Um, 
yeah, simple thing there for that one. Um, catching, again, I'm sure we do this in the mornings at fives to eights, just throwing up the ball. Um, and you can kick it, you can throw it up, you can change it around. Like I've seen you guys do this plenty, so that's something else that you guys can uh, do with those younger age groups. Um, Chris, can I could just come in? Uh, one thing of I course. to mention, um, on something like that, if, if a ball goes into another pod, you know, just, just get the kids to kick it back. That's all we're asking. You know, obviously, if, if, they, if they pass it back, just chuck it in, disinfect it, and then use it again. But it's common sense. But, you know, if, just kick, if a ball it just goes into another pod, kick it back. Fun. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I'm sure that, and I'm sure that will happen plenty in these, in these younger age groups anyway. Um, uh, Des just asked, uh, what's a strategy to explain? Um, I would suggest you do one of two things. Either um, you use one group. If you're in the middle and you can't, then you're not part of the, the group. I would suggest that you use one group that is easily seen and talk them through it and get them to actively demonstrate. That's probably going to be your best bet to do it. Otherwise, if you have a coach that is within the, the exercise, again, similarly, if you have one coach that's acting as a, as a player within one exercise, they can help demonstrate and then everyone else should get the idea. Um, I would imagine the hardest groups to explain to are going to be the younger ones, but also they're going to be the ones that's going to have a coach in each section. So it should hopefully be a little bit easier to manipulate the kids and get them to understand where they should be going. Um, but yeah, in short, I would, if you are one coach to three sections, for example, or four sections, use one section to demonstrate what's going on and help you set up and then go from there. Um, sweet. I think we've done the catching. Uh, next, uh, dinosaur eggs. Again, I've seen this one played absolutely loads. Balls in the middle. Um, you can have one one kid as a as a coach or ref, as it says here, and they are on the corner trying to sprint in, get the egg, come back out, and try and get the extra ball. So you don't necessarily just have to have five balls. You could have nine, and they're they're just racing in to get as many of those uh, balls as they can. Uh, as it says again. Fast kids, you can penalise them for two or five seconds or make them do something extra like a, um, like a pass to a coach or um, turn around, touch the ground type thing. Whatever you want to do, just make it imaginative to make it a little bit tougher for those faster or more able kids. Uh, Bulldogs, again, I shouldn't need to explain this one. Um, I'm sure plenty of you know this one. Four kids, one end, one in the middle is just trying to touch them as they rush across from, from left to right on the screen as, as is shown here. Um, change the kids. Put more kids in defence, whatever, whatever works there. Uh, chain ball. Um, so this has got two different pods. Um, pod A down here, pod B. Uh, kids out on a line, obviously the wider they are, the harder it's going to be. All players on their knees, you can make it difficult. They can be on one leg, they can be um, on their knees, they can be on one knee, change it around. Pass the ball down the line. Um, all, once it reaches the end, then the first player passes the next ball until all the balls have gone, and then they can go all the way back. You can change that around as well, where the first player runs around or something like that. Um, again, I've seen this done plenty, so I'm sure you guys will have um, far more ideas and knowledge on what works best for this sort of stuff anyway. But the key here is, I think it's having it a pod versus pod is going to make it more... Um, enjoyable for the kids. Anything that you guys can do in all of this that makes it competitive, especially for these younger kids, is going to make it more enjoyable. Whether that's competing within pods or competing within the pod itself, um, it's going to make it far more enjoyable for the kids. Uh, awesome. On to the under eights to under 12s. Now I'm going to start showing a few more videos um, that I've got. Uh, the videos are kind of uh, from, from the Singapore national team. So, um, Obviously, these exercises are good for developing skill, which is why the national team have been doing it. Uh, so, for uh, let's move on. Uh, tic tac toe. I'll show you this one again. If you're if you're teaching a school, you've probably played this before. Certainly, it's where I picked it up. Split into two teams. You can have a three, team of three on two, or if you've got only four, two and two. Um, Nine cones represent where you can put the naught or cross in the tic-tac-toe grid and each team has three cones of one colour. 
Um, one player at a time goes out to put down the cone and it's first to get three in a row wins. So if you at first get all three cones down and don't complete three in a row, then the next person just goes out and has to change a cone. So I've got a uh, demonstration of this. Um, bear with me. There we go. Uh, can you all see my, still screen, see my screen, yeah? You see this bit? Perfect. Okay. Uh, hopefully, if I play here, uh, you'll see what's going on. Um, so just resetting it up. So you've got uh, this team here have got blue cones. This team here have got yellow. And then you've got the nine cones here, which demonstrate where, where the noughts or crosses would be. Um, then it's going to be one at a time who can who can go out and change it so you see a full game here so you can choose where to put it and then teammates just go it's just a race there so this team got on the left got three blues in a row but obviously you might get sometimes you get it where it doesn't quite match up so yeah so you got them blocked off here so they've got to choose different places to be able to go and change it around so this team got three in a row there Hopefully that makes sense, guys. A little bit of a visual representation of that one. It does make more sense as you start to play it. You'll start to see that one take shape. Uh, then next one, uh, quarters passing. So using those same uh, squares that you had in the first uh, under five to under eights section, um, trying to score as many points as you can, you get a point for passing diagonally. So as you can see here, you get one point for passing diagonally across, but no points from passing um, uh, across the edge of the square. Um, adjacent box, as it says. Uh, defender in the middle is aiming to knock down the ball and, and prevent them from getting points. Um, and as it says, extra points for kicks or double points if the kick is, is with their wrong foot. And add and change rules to make it a little bit more fun. So catching it with one hand, um, catching it above heads, something that's going to make it a little bit, bit, bit trickier. Um, and changing the ball around is going to make it a little bit uh, tougher as well. This sort of stuff, hopefully, if you know that you're going to go from a warm-up where you used four cones in a square for each and each person inside a square, then trying to make a good flow of exercises given we've only got an hour and moving into things like this will be really beneficial. So the better you can plan your session to flow easily with equipment set up in a similar way and, and, and less changes in equipment is going to be just the better for you guys uh, getting a productive session done. Uh, cool. Next one, 1v1. Again, uh, we've done, I've seen everyone do this one, but um, it says thinner channel than, than seven meters wide. Stop players running um, off to the side, uh, and it's just uh, it's just evasion again. Uh, very similar to to uh, to what I've seen everybody do. Um, obviously, change the change the people around. You can have loads of goes at this in a short period of time. Um, you don't need to be having like you could set up two channels easily and and have uh, and have these guys going um regularly so the more the more reps you can get of anything the better it's going to be for the guys uh sweet passing skills okay i'm going to uh, show on the video uh, a few of these that we've got so hopefully these these um statements will make a little bit more sense but this is the sort of stuff that i would suggest you guys are doing as the kids turn up so if if you're the head coach and you see little Jimmy and Billy have turned up and there's only two of them in their quadrant, in their square. Um, you can get them doing this sort of stuff just to get them started before the rest of their team starts to turn up. So, um, so a few examples here. Is this the right one? Not the right one. Uh, sorry, bear with me. Yeah, here we go. So this is what I mean by tip taps. So they're just, uh, we're just, throwing it up and down, trying to make it difficult to catch. Not impossible, but kind of forcing each other into um, into kind of the extremes of catching. Um, I Maybe it was a little bit hard there. That is me, by the way, if anyone's wondering. Um, <laughs> then you've got... Uh, passing from... Uh, oh, this one we're doing, sorry, we're... we're Feigning as if we're going to cross. So if you watch the catcher, he's catching it, receiving it as soon as he can before pushing the ball across. Does that make sense, guys? So receiving as far away from the body as you can to then get whip that ball away. So that's what we're practicing here. Then the next one is passing from the front. Um, so we're just 
getting the wrists working. So you're playing, passing from the front of the belly button, chest between chest and belly button and pushing the ball out. So it's all about wrist action and wrist strength um, rather than necessarily winding up with your arms. Then what else have we got? Um, I'm being told off for there as well, in case you saw, missed that, for not pointing my fingers. So make sure you're pointing the fingers as well. Uh, next one is passing from the front of the hip. So we're generating a little bit more power from the arms and shoulders. So passing from the front of the hip instead of pulling back. Then you've got next one will be, next advance one will be passing from the back hip. So you can see uh, a few of the guys here passing from the back of their hip um, and going across the body. I think we're nearly there. Uh, back of the hip. Then we've got, uh, oh, this one's just starting in front again. So front, back, middle of the body. Then we moved on to the throwing the ball up and then quickly transferring across. So a little throw up and then as quick as we can get in, zipping that ball across. Okay. Uh, then there is another one. Sorry, we'll come to all these. Uh, where is it? Oh, I don't know where exactly where it is. Sorry, bear with me, guys. Uh, there's one more uh, little one that you can do with kind of uh, once once the whole group's there. So if you watch these guys, you've got two balls. You've got one ball going left to right, and then you've got one ball coming in and out uh, in, in front of them. So it takes a little bit of coordination between them, takes a little bit of skill from the guy in the middle to uh, pass the ball quickly. But uh, there we go should be promoting some good quick hands. So back to the presentation, we've got tip tap, which was the knocking around, trying to get it out wide, front on on the wrist, front hip, back hip, then in the middle as well, quick transfer coming across the body after you receive it. Um, receive and push, uh, push the ball, um, so that's ch chucking it up, pushing the ball across, and then in out and forward back, which is the one we just saw there. So there are loads of skills that you can get going before the session's even started or have as a little interlude at any point while maybe you're getting two kids to set up while two kids are doing some passing. Or, or equally, this is the type of stuff that would be really good while you're clearing out um, pod by pod. So if pod one is leaving and you've got pod 10 waiting, this is the type of thing that would be good for them to be doing in that waiting time. Don't just leave them standing around. Give them something po positive to be doing. Um, very similar, uh, this is just kind of making it into a little bit of a competition. So, um, except the kids are facing different ways. So one's facing up the pitch, the other's facing back the other way. Um, 10 passes one way, turn around 10 the other, and it's the first team to complete 20, 20 catches without dropping the ball. Uh, making it harder by making it wider. So this is far more based on the competition element rather than what I just, rather than all this stuff, which is based on the skill element of, of, of it. Um, quick two versus ones. I'll just show you this one rather than talk through, but you just need five players for this one. Uh, there we go. You don't need quite so big a distance between the two. I'd say maybe you just need two or three meters. Um, between the two groups, but the basic premise is that you've got um, you've got two players with the ball. If they get if the player gets touched by the defender in the middle, they then become the defender, and then so we're getting the hang of it here. Yeah, so it's two v one, and they're constantly trying to get the um, get through without being touched. If you get touched, then you go into the middle. Um, if you uh, and the defender just stays until there's a mistake. So there's a mistake there. So one of these uh, ladies is going to come in and she's now in the middle. And then you'll keep going until you're touched with the ball or there is a mistake made. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So touch there. So that lad will, will then go into the middle and be the defender. Cool. Next one. Uh... So this one's a little bit more, um, would you say, Mike, this is a little bit more um, phase play based? Yeah, correct. Yep. So you've got uh, 
Sorry, Mike, do you want to explain this one? Because I haven't actually had a chance it's to read it. So, it. so you got a, you've got a, so you've got a coach, didn't have to be a coach, coach or a kid on the pad. Um, uh, basically, first player, first player runs, uh, has a ball, runs into the pad, goes down, uh, second rucks over, uh, third that's the scrum half, passes the ball to four, four goes and scores a try uh, in between the two codes. So it's just phase play, getting people into going to ground, rucking over, picking up the ball, spinning it out, scoring a try. Okay, you can do, you've got plenty of room to do that in the, in the pod area. Um, and then I think if you've got the next one, uh, we've got Protective Plus after that. Is, it, is that you got the next uh, Yep, bear with me. Yep. And then all we're doing here is you're having the you go on the pad, uh, kid or coach on the pad, just moving, and you, you can get probably two or three phases in. So he's, once the tackle's been made on one and the ruck's happened, the guy is sprinting over, tackling four, and then you're, um, you're seeing how the players get into first one ruck over, second one goes into a scrum half, spins it out to whatever player. And you work your way up the up the up the pod. You should be able to get two or three pages. It allows the kids to then think about what roles, spit it back out from go into scrum off, go into um, go into wing position, and, and just move up move up the pod. Perfect. So the the good thing about this as well, like if you've if you've got the pad in there, then you've got a um, you've got a coach that can hopefully direct a little bit if that's the kind of if you're looking for that a little bit more phase play work. Cool. Spot on. Thank you for those, Mike. Next one, Scramble. Sorry, this one's yours again, mate. I haven't had a chance to properly read through. Uh, uh, yeah, so again, four players. Um, you, you put a ball in the middle, uh, shout go, and then basically, um, again, it's a different, it's a different thing. Whoever gets the ball um, charges into the guy on the pad, and then they all have to figure out and get into their right positions. So it just, um, again, it's just, it's, it's just, it's just a scramble. It's just less structured right at the beginning. So whoever gets to that ball first, um, and they have to figure out whether they ruck, or they go scrum half, and then who's going to be on the wing to score. So again, same same um, game, just a slightly different start position. Perfect. So a little bit of um, decision making with alignment as well. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. Uh, passing race pod versus pod. Um, so nice and simple. You've got five players uh, in a line. Um, fifth kid, the guy on the end, is just going to try and score in this corner. Um, you can then uh, turn it around, come back if you want to go there and back. Whatever you want to do, just passing races to to encourage quick movement of the ball. Um, I've got an example here. So builds, passing off both hands left, right, changing positions to so make sure you don't always have this kid on the edge and um, adding poles race. So... Here, bear with me. Sorry, guys, not this one. Here we go. So uh, this is when we finally started getting the hang of it. Might take a little bit to get the hang, but you've got one, two, three, four players here, and you've got one, two, three, four poles, which are kind of faux defenders um, that they are trying to draw and pass at. So it's exactly the same as, as the last one, except you've got kind of fake defenders in there. The idea is it's going to come all the way down the line until it hits this guy. He's going to, sorry, uh, yeah, so he's going to drop it here. Everyone's got to go around this pole and then they come back the other way. So I'll play it the easiest way to show you. So you've got to take it up to the pole, pass along, ball goes down, everyone then comes back and we do the same thing back, trying to hold width and it's a little race to see who comes to the middle. Obviously you can't do it this close given your pods, but you can do the same race spread apart. I'll show a few more times just so you get a good idea of what's going on here. So everyone's got to go around the outside of that last pole. And then, yeah, the, the better organised they are on that, the, the more likely they are to, to uh, be successful. Let's see if we can get another one more good time through. So got to take it right up to the pole. Someone gaff that up. Fortunately, it wasn't me. And that's what you're looking for there, okay? Um, the keys there as well as your coaching is making sure, which we did quite badly here, is making sure this last person is, isn't is drifting across and and, and uh, taking that last bit of space. So if you have a touch line or something here to encourage them to stay within, that will keep them tight in their in their, their handling. So that's what I mean by adding the poles and, and, have, and, and that the poles race um, can be added in there. Uh, 
gate passing skills. Again, I'll show you this rather than talk through the slide. Um, hopefully the slide is just a little jog, at, uh, jog for when we do send it out. But uh, here is what's going on. You've got one, two, three players, one, two, three sets of poles. The idea is to get through the poles uh, successfully and then pass once you are through. So you can obviously have these poles far narrower, and I would suggest you probably do for the kids. Um, obviously, these guys are, are hopefully the best players in the country, but uh, some some still need a little bit of work on the skills, but that's what you're looking for there. You probably could have a fourth player on the edge here um, to, to receive another pass in behind. But that's something you could you could use as well. So again, like if your session you, you know and you are aware of that you're going to use two sets of poles, then that obviously is, it kind of leads quite well one into the other. Uh, hopefully that's given a good example of that. I'll show one more example. Perfect. So obviously that just means that the kids are trying to stay square, run straight uh, and, and, and pull back the pass successfully. Uh, next one uh, is a four or five man catch pass exercise. Might need to be four man if um, I wasn't quite sure on the rules, but it might need to be four man and then this cross is, a, is the fifth player. You start by passing down the line, ball goes to here, then they come around and do a wider pass. Again, I've got a video to show this rather than uh, rather than it be me. Sorry, Zoom is annoying me. Here we go. Uh, here we go. So starts off narrow and then gets wide. So this is halfway through, so just ignore this a little bit. So you've got one, two, three, four, starting in a narrow part of the, of the drill. Just start the first person with the ball. They then got to spread wide and pass wide as quickly as you can. So again, it's, it's practicing alignment, it's practicing width, um, uh, width or playing with width. So quick hands all the way along, turn, and then they come back the other way passing through. Cool, hopefully that's a uh, good um, demonstration of that. Next one, you got 10 pass. I don't have, a, um, don't have a video of this one. So you can have a three versus two or a four versus one. It's basically an advancement of this one. So you can do this, a similar sort of thing, but you can move in any direction. You can't move with the ball. Uh, so you can pass in a direction while trying to get up to 10 consecutive passes. The ball carrier cannot move with the ball. Um, and it's just and trying to find space with your, with your attacking teammates. Um, sort the defenders every so often um, or when 10 passes are achieved. Um, it is a turnover or, re or, the, or the pass is reset when the ball hits the floor or there is an intercept. If you want to advance it, you can do one hand catching and passing, no overhead passes or limit the time in which you have to pass the ball. Uh, again, it's kind of like rugby netball, you score a point by making a pass rather than passing it to an end zone. Uh, sorry, I know I've got a few questions to pop up. Just see if any of those I can answer as we go. Uh, the only one that you and Robbie can have a point of view on is yep. if we are getting into pads and, and rocking over with pads, do we need to instruct... Uh, uh, state uh, whether we need mouth guards for the kids. Robbie, point of view. You're on mute, Robbie. Robbie, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I would say they don't necessarily need them at all, but having a mouth guard in is, is a good safety precaution. Hitting the pads, they shouldn't be doing it at 100% anyway, only at 50. They're not all piling into each other. So there's a lot of um, steps in there that mitigate the, the, the necessity or the potential for somebody to getting uh, a bang in the mouth. But given that we don't have, I can't remember, I'm gonna, we probably have 10 pads. So if there's 10 pods uh, going at any one time, uh, there's all the pads being used. So people have to be one prepared. And I would suggest that they have some of their pods having pads one week and the rest of them having pods the next 
pods having pads the next week and so on and, uh, and rotating it that way. But math card, bring it along. No harm. Cool. Um, so on. Uh, Mike, if you see any question pop up that you feel is pertinent at the time, just give me a shout if that's okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I've called this constant attack. Um, loads of you might have seen this in some variation played, maybe with more players. Um, but I've put three attackers down the bottom here and they're attacking this try line here with two defenders. You can, of course, do a four versus one if you feel your kids aren't quite up to three versus two. Um, or you can do a three versus one, whatever you want to do. Um, the defenders can't leave the line or can't really come off it. You kind of limit them to within two meters of that line. And the attackers have a set amount of time to just constantly attack. So, you, for example, you give them 30 seconds or two minutes just to endlessly attack the line. If they drop the ball, they just got to or get touched. They just got to pass the ball back to their start line to then go again. Or you can have several balls lined up and they just got to pick up a ball and play again. So I've got an example here um, of a seven versus five. Um, which is the exact same principle, but obviously just played with more players. So it's seven versus five. Uh, obviously, sorry, this camera is not brilliant, but it's exactly the same principle. These defenders and bibs can't come off uh, the line. As soon as there's a touch, they've got to come back to the line before they attack again. And then they're just trying to score over the line. Um, it's a constant exercise. As soon as there's a touch, they've got to go back. Um, you might not want to make it that far back just so they get a few more touches, but that's the principle of the game. So they mucked up, either they pass the ball back or they just come and find another ball on the line here. Um, so yeah, same principles, just fewer numbers in what we're doing. Uh, so that's it for the un, up to the under 12s. These ones under 13s to 17s are um, maybe a little bit tougher probably could be put down into younger age, younger age groups, just need to be a little bit tailored and probably made easier. Um, so three versus two, um, you got two channels, oh, sorry, a channel, three attackers versus two defenders. Um, again, you guys know what the, how good your players are. If you need to make it wider to make it easier, then feel free, but 12 meters here, three versus two, take it in turns to go forward. If they're tackled, place long, place the ball backwards. You can make it continuous, so just pop it off the ground and keep playing, or um, you can just reset and go again. Um, you can advance that from the one-on-one -on -one as well. So I've, I've seen this one loads, where you have three, like two versus ones, three versus twos, the same principle, but just change the numbers around. So that's an, another advancement there where you can maybe tie into those two exercises together. Um, another advancement of that here, where you have, you start in this bottom corner with three attackers against one defender. They come forward, once they beat him, the three attackers come around the corner into this main channel against one defender who uh, is there and then the original defender comes across and joins him to make a three on two. So three attackers start against one, they come around to make a three on two and then you can just keep cycling through this and changing the defenders in and out. But it just hopefully gives a little bit more cyclic motion and, and, and variability to, to what they're doing. You can make this first channel very narrow and this one very wide just to replicate a little bit more in a game what, you might, ha what might happen. Uh, again, again, exactly the same, pretty much uh, set up as this one, sorry, as this one, except that you have added, um, uh, you have added, you've got an extra set of cones. So you've got green cones along here, red cones, blue cones, and they're starting along this line here. The green cones obviously give you lots of width and the blue cones obviously give you very little width. So um, the coach calls the color or a player calls the color and it's three attackers against one or two defenders. And then that obviously the color determines how much width they have to attack into. Um, keys to coach with, keep making sure they stay straight and aligned, especially in this very narrow one and just push the players to see how tight they can successfully execute a three versus two. Um, then this one, I don't have a video for this. I did try and find it because it's quite, uh, it takes a little bit of, you need to kind of see it to, to or play it to kind of understand. But first thing you've got to do is have the pitch set up like this. So you have 
a red line here, blue line, orange line, green line. What you'll have is you'll have all the kids in the middle. You'll have three or four attackers against one or two defenders. Um, and what will happen is you will shout a colour. So, for example, if you shout blue, that then determines the orientation of the pitch. So, if you shout blue, the defenders have got to defend down, while down kind of down towards the bottom of the page, while the attackers are trying to attack that blue line. That changes the orientation and determines which way they can then pass the ball. So, players have got to work to get back on side to then to get to then get the ball. Uh, once the attacks succeeded or failed. Um, another colour is called. So you might attack blue and they might score in this corner and then you shout orange and then the ball carrier's got to come forward and his other teammates have got to get behind him to be able to attack. Again, it's something that makes a bit more sense while you see it played. Um, maybe it's something I'll play at the weekend and, and video for you guys so you can see that if that's something that's um, quite difficult to, to, to grasp. Hopefully you guys understand it. Um, you can advance it by calling the colours quicker. If they don't score in time, then um, just call a different colour. If there's a touch, obviously, you've probably got to call a different colour. Um, and then another rule advance is that the um, attack can then pass in any direction. But then the last pass before they score on the orange has to be backwards for that orange cone. Again, I'd advance this after a week or two of maybe playing this one. Um, for the, I, I would imagine the under-17s would pick this up fairly quickly, under 13 is probably not quite so much. So um, worth giving it a go, but phase it in over a few weeks. Uh, right, next one. 10 kick, same rules as 10 pass, but you just kick in. Make it harder if you want to use the wrong foot, give extra points, double points if they kick with their left foot, for example. Uh, obviously, this one's pretty good for the backs. Forwards are probably going to be an absolute nightmare on it, but it's still a good skill to have. We want our players to be uh, all-round players, so I wouldn't be afraid to throw this at your forwards as well. Uh, I, could, I would imagine, um, especially after a few weeks, that we would want to start incorporating some unit skills. Um, I, di I didn't know that Mike was going to say that we can't do line outs, so that kind of ruins half of my uh, points there. But you can still do scrum positions. Hookers can still throw a ball, uh, practice their throwing. Um, you can still practice a line out lift with a pad, so using a big tube pad. You can still get kids practicing lifting overhead and getting their positioning right. They just can't lift another kid. Is that right, Mike? Um... I'll pass that on to. I'd have to go through the SRU guidelines. I haven't got them in front of me at the moment. I can send them to you, but at the moment, if I remember rightly, the SRU guidelines just fundamentally say no scrums, no lineouts. Uh, yeah, I've pretty much lifted that. So, Kim, do you have okay. a Well, if that's the case, let's assume that you can't do lineouts. You can still have your hookers throwing. You can still have your front row adopting scrummaging positions. So in that power position, hands on the floor or hands on balls. There's loads of things that you can do to get into good scrummaging or uh, rocking positions without actually going into contact. So you can do this sort of stuff without actually necessarily having to do contact itself uh, or the line out or the scrum. Uh, back, uh, nines, you can practice box kicking. Tens can practice punting. Um, I put tackle, but I mean more tackle technique. So getting your foot in the right place, initiating contact with the right shoulder. Um, again, you don't need to necessarily make contact for this. It's just the principles of getting the foot and the shoulder in the right place. Um, back three can be practicing catching high balls. So you can do unit skills. You just need to be a little bit imaginative about exactly what you're practicing and how it's relevant for that skill. Um, this could be something, if you have some ideas or want some ideas from me, please feel free to ask. Um, I've got a few ideas in mind uh, on this. Next one, passing skills. I've got a um, video for this one. Three attackers, one, two, three on the crosses, and these are two pads. Ball gets passed in, and they're just trying to draw the attacker by um, attacking and aiming at the inside shoulder um, so that he is pulled in successfully. Passing as late as possible, taking the ball right to the line um, so the wide man can score. So I'm going to show a video of this one. Uh, here we go. I think you're going to see some brilliant passing from me. No, nope, not in this one. Uh, so tacking the inside shoulder here. So you saw they're both they're aiming for the inside of the pad. They've got a little scoot across here to make sure that they're then coming in straight rather than going from into out. 
we're making sure we're coming across and then co going straight to, to draw the man. Okay, hopefully that gives you a good uh, view of that. It's just a little bit of skill and the, the challenge here is getting as close to the line as you can before making the pass. If they run over the pad, that's a good thing. We want our players drawing the players and if you're running over a pad, you're probably going to have drawn the player. Uh, cool, next one. Uh, same thing, same principle, except the two defenders are now um, guys, like uh, players, and they're running from the breakdown, trying to get across as quickly as they can on a heavy drift defence. You might need to play this one as a, as a three attackers, passer, and then two outside against one defender. Um, but you can still tinker this one around. Um, bear with me. Uh, Sorry, give me a second, guys. I think like this one. Yeah, uh, no. Sorry, everyone. Just trying to find the right one for this. Uh, okay, hopefully it makes a, uh, enough sense as to what's going on without me having to show you this one because I can't seem to find it too easily. Uh, yeah, sorry guys. Um, yeah, here we go. Sorry, I found it, found it. So you've got two defenders. They start at the breakdown and they're just trying to get across to to defend the um, the guys who are passing. Obviously then the attackers, their their role is to draw the passes, uh, the defenders successfully. I hope that's a good demonstration of what's going on there. To show you again, again, you've got the little shift out to then make sure that uh, we then going out to then straightening up um, from there. Cool. Uh, next one, three versus two with a defensive change. So you've got same principle, except that the defenders are now lining up against one and two, against the first two. And what happens is initiated by the coach calling a color. So it could be that he calls uh, red and they just go straight up. Blue, they've got to go backwards and then up, or orange, and they've got to go backwards and up as well. So defenders are coming from different areas and different parts of the, uh, or sort of different angles. So it makes it a little bit more tricky for the um, for the attackers. So I believe this one is it. Nope, sorry, that's what I've already showed you. Yeah, here we go. So uh, this one has a red cone here, which means the defenders go straight up or a yellow cone where they will back pedal before going up. So there's only two colors. So this, this one was a red, so came straight up. Uh, that wasn't the greatest example. So that one was a yellow, they had to go back. I think someone still mucked it up, but that's the idea. They're just trying to pass across wide. It might be that you just start the first person without, with the ball rather than receiving the ball just to, to make sure that the numbers are all safe. So this one was yellow, they had to go back and then the draw and pass came from there. I'll just show you one more so you get a good idea. So you've got two defenders on the cones. They had to go back before coming forward. And the idea is for them to draw and uh, draw and pass. Okay, uh, we're almost there, guys. Uh, five meters, three versus two. I'll show you this one. It is much much easier than than seeing this. But this is the initial setup. I don't think actually we can do this one. It might have to be a five meter, uh, four, three versus one, or something. Just might need to tinker a little bit before we go. But here is the basic plan. Um, So I'll just play this one. So you've got two coaches here, one and two. You might just be that you have one, uh, one player here instead. You've got one person in the middle, they're called to a direction and then it becomes a three on two. I've also, um, you would have a two on one with the one coach here. So just take out one extra player from each side of this. You've got one, two, three, who come back and then come up and go up turn and attack and then you've got one player who starts in the middle who then becomes the scrum half okay so i would run exactly this but i'd take out 
one defender and one attacker. So it becomes a three on uh, a, th a three on one. Yeah. So pass and a two on one. I'll play it one more time so you can have a or one more time so you have a look. So you've got this player here. I hear he's pretty rubbish. In the middle, he's told to go left or right. So he goes one way. Attackers will go and turn, and then their, their aim is to pass along in that five meter channel. Okay. Um, so I will adjust this slightly to make it sure that there's only five people, but that's the basic premise that you just saw there. Other things um, that you can do, so under 15s and 17s, so JG, uh, Robbie, we can practice, and the under 14s, 13s can practice maybe our nail and taxi. Uh, sorry, not nail and taxi. Uh, sorry, nail and taxi with uh, with the forwards and, and passing that, but that's something we'll discuss separately. Other things to consider, guys, just in general, is um, how to make it more fun, add in different balls, take away a hand so they can only use one hand, uh, make them use their weaker hand, make them use their feet, make them use their weaker foot. Um, the more variation and the more passes and um, contacts that kids make with the ball, the more fun it's going to be for them. So the good thing about all the things I've shown you here for us is that we can cycle through about 40 reps in, in less than 10 minutes. And I probably wouldn't even go for 10 minutes on any of these. So the real good promising thing is that although we have very few players, we can get a lot of good things done for those players in each group because we are in such small groups. It's a really good opportunity for us to really refine and um, advance our kids' skills um, by giving them lots of touches and giving them lots of opportunity to experiment and get things wrong. Um, doesn't need to be perfect. All of these things, guys, if you go through these, every single one of these is going to push them to make mistakes. We want our kids making mistakes because that's how they learn. That's how they get better. We don't want it looking perfect. This is definitely not the training session and training types of exercises that we want to see things executed perfectly. If it is going well and no one has made any mistakes, you must make it harder for them. Um, equally, if you see that you've got one kid that is very, very far behind, it's probably worth next week considering putting him with a group in which he is more closely um, associated with those kids on their skill level so that he gets more out of it. Uh, rather than being left behind from the other kids in this group. Um, this is probably one of the few times I would really advocate uh, streaming to a very high degree so that all the kids are pushed in their individual five. You don't have to make it very cut and dry, but you can you can still maybe put your five of your top 10 in one group and, and five of your bottom 10 in another group so they make sure they're all pushed at the same level. Um, perfect. That's it from me, guys. Uh, Robbie, Mike, anything to add on top of, of what I said there? Thanks, Chris. So um, just a couple of points. Just looking, just to confirm, SIU guidelines, no rucks, malls, lineouts, or scrums. Okay, so um, it's pretty much uh, there in black and white. So uh, yep. to confirm, that's, uh, that's on the document. Um, look, I, I, a couple of people, uh, I think... Um, uh, have asked what, what we need to do. Robbie, myself and Chris are working on getting this doc in a way. I, don't, I, I know that you're obviously using a different piece of software there, uh, um, Chris, so I'm not sure if, we, if, if you're able to share those vids. Maybe you can play them with a phone and up, you know, somewhere, you know, and then and, and produce a file. I don't know. Um, but what we're, what we're going to do is we're going to get this doc into whatever shape we can by the end of play tomorrow. And then, and then share it so that we can, uh, you can start to plan uh, your sessions and hopefully this will give you some guidance. We'd, we'd ask you, you'll think of your own stuff and then just please add to it. So we will try and, when we share this, it will be in a Google Docs shared environment. So you can just add a chart and then um, uh, and move forward. So that one will come out um, end of play tomorrow. Uh, I take on board the mouth guards, um, so if you as a head coach are doing drills, even though obviously it needs to be clear that they're going at 50%, um, but advise at a uh, age group level to bring mouth guards. Um, uh, the other thing, again, just a reminder, water bottles, all the kids will need to take their water bottles into their pod. We can't have them coming, running around, having a chat with mum and dad and everybody else and then going back. So water bottles in the pod. Uh, Garrett, you had a question. Have we thought about communication between coaches 
especially at the start of a session. Do you want to do you want to add on that? What you, where you're coming from? Yeah, look, I think there's two things. One is I think it's going to make it much more important that we obviously do a huge amount of planning amongst each of the the groups in advance. But the second thing is, if there's more than five coaches, are they allowed to meet beforehand? You know, to go through yeah. the drill. Yeah, well, I mean, when you say meet, um, you, you're just on the pitch beforehand and sort of uh, say, okay. Well, we'll well it depends. On where, it depends on how you're allocating your coaches. Um, you know, I think that if you all uh, and um, and your missus who's sitting next to me will either shake her head or agree with me, what you could do is if you all get there 15 minutes early, you will go into the pitch and you're sitting in the coaches area and have a conversation around that. I think that's fine. And then when it, when it, 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 it has a five, then when you then start, you will go to your pods or your positions. I think that's fine. But you, what you don't want to do is have everyone arriving and then then regrouping once everybody's held or potentially been with a kid. So I think if you all get there 15 minutes early, you sit in a coach's pod, you're registered, you're in your, you're in your ropes and you're all sitting there having a chat in groups of five, then fine. But, I, I, you know, you're right. It is going to be about planning. It's going to be set how you allocate your coaches. You might want to put coaches into a pod subject to the numbers you've got. You might have two on the outside. I don't know. But that's, yeah, it's going to be about planning as much as you can in advance. Yeah, I, I, I think Garrett, that conversation well beforehand uh, will be required. And maybe if one coach doesn't quite understand the drill, you can demonstrate it there and then. But to try and, as a head coach, come, give the instructions to the other four guys, and then for them to flick through them and try to figure out under pressure what they have to do will be a tall order. Because a lot of the stuff... You know, Chris has given us a lot. We don't have to bite off the biggest, most problematic drill straight away. But in order to go smoothly and a little bit more enjoyable, it will necessitate a lot more preparation than what would have been normally the case. So a morning, like if you're on Saturday afternoon, then you've got to spend the Saturday morning having a chat with each other uh, on the phones, make sure everybody's comfortable. The stuff is shared well in advance. You know what coaches are going to run what drills. Uh, you know what order they're going to be in. Uh, it's not going to be without its problems, but as prepared as possible in advance will mean that it's just going to smooth um, run a little bit smoother. No, um, thank you. So uh, these drills have been have been have been great. It allows the chance to plan in advance. Yeah, sweet uh, guys. Like um, as always, if if you would like, if you need to ask any questions or would like to ask any questions, please feel free to, to fire them over. I can help as best I can uh, remotely. Um, so we've recorded this meeting. Um, Mike, would it be okay? I think, unfortunately I can't get the videos off. I can't get those videos off of the, uh, that I showed on here, but can we clip this last hour, whatever that we've just spoken about them and then have that as a link to a YouTube video? Uh, sounds like a good plan. I will put my, uh, I'll, I'll qu question whether I've got the technical ability to do it, but I'll have a go. Perfect. Um, again, if you need help, feel free to ask. Yeah, it's recorded. We must be able to do it. So, um, yeah. Um, perfect. I think, I think that's probably the best way of having all this. So hopefully most people from most age group, most age groups are represented in seeing what this means to some degree. And then you've got the video to refer back to if you need a little bit of reminding of what it should look like. Um, there. Uh, yeah, I guys like you've got 45 minutes and an hour and to an hour session. In reality, you probably need a good 10 minute warm up in which you're doing a good skill base and then no more than no more than six of these I would say in that in that hour um, and, and then you've got a good session there by the time you swapped everything over and got everything explained you don't need anything more than that um, and there's 30 exercises in there for you to choose from so plenty to get on with plenty to um, make a good session plan there and then as Mike and Robbie are saying in weeks two, three, four, five, that's when we can start being a little bit more imaginative about, about our session plans. Do you want to answer uh, Rene's question? I haven't seen it yet, but I can do. No, Kim. Ah. Um, 
It is, it is basically for the period whilst we're restricted to five in a pod, because when those restrictions lift, dependent on what they go to, cricket will likely come back and we will lose the pitches on the weekend. Um, because obviously TRC term is meant to be over um, and they have contractual agreements. So it's set in stone currently for as long as those restrictions last. And we don't know if that's going to be two weeks or two months at this stage. Uh, and if I can just add on that, look, if, if we do get bumped by cricket, um, and everyone's keen to go out and it's going to be subject to your availability as coaches, then I would, we'll find a solution. We've got the evenings, you know, if you can do stuff after work, we could, cricket may, departing at five o'clock, we could do some early evenings as well. So on Saturday and Sunday. So we can make it work, but let's, let's work under this for the first couple of weeks, as Kim said. And then if we need to be more creative, we'll be more creative. Um... Any, any, anything else? Mike, Thank can you. I ask a quick question? We're, we're, we're down to a smaller group, so I hope you don't mind me asking. Um, um, coaches wearing masks, uh, is there flexibility to wear the face shields that teachers wear, or is that something to consider for the future maybe, and we just go with masks first time around? Um, you know, the, the, the face shields, I don't know if you've seen them that the yeah. teachers wear. Yeah, good Our, question. I don't have the answer to that. Um, Robbie, I'm wondering if that's an SRU question that you could raise with... I'll, uh, I'll check with SRU. Um, it's obviously just a, from a point of view of being able to communicate. I exactly. shout and people hear it rather than muffled. Uh, leave that one with me, Bill. I'll check with SRU first thing in the morning. Well, we, just to confirm, Bill, the, the, the point that we said is if you have a coach in a pod which you may obviously not but if you have if you are in a pod we're saying you can take the mask off obviously it's when they're yeah got it the long lines yeah okay yeah i guess if, if if we go with that approach where you have coaches running up and down that tram line um covering multiple pods yeah. no i hate yeah they're going to be moving and shouting um so so yeah but look very happy to go with whatever the the guidance is um um whatever you think and, and stick to masks first time round. But if, if we get an easy answer from SRU, then great. Okay. I, I can, I have, because my wife is a teacher, I've got loads of these face shields. So I can, I can bring some along if people want to, uh, you know, uh, want to try them out. But let, let's see what they say. Cool. Uh, anything else? You Mike? Mean? Yeah, quick, quick one. If we don't have a lot of players, can we merge pods to make them bigger? Or is it just, uh, uh, it's not give, me, give, me a, give me a story. So let's say you're turning up with 20 players. Yeah. 20, yeah, correct. Um, in, in effect, what we are saying, if you turn up with 20 players, you can merge pods as long as you still adhere to five in a pod. So if you take the example of the layout that, that I shared, if you wanted to merge one and two, uh, then that would be fine. Okay. Yeah, okay, but you Great. are still then you can you cannot put more players in that area. It's still five players. No, that's good. Yeah, that so it's one. fine for a container. Okay, it's, yeah, um, and you just have to imagine that three meter line going down. Okay, thanks. Anything else? If not, uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I will get this deck out or get my deck out tonight. Um, and then we'll work on other comms uh, tomorrow. Um, so appreciate your time. I know it's been a long one. Um, and uh, if there's any other questions, just give Kim, Robbie, or myself, um, or Lee a shout. Hey, thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks for all the work in, in uh, sorting all this out. No problem. Yeah, thanks, thanks, a lot. Lot. thanks, Kim. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Awesome. Cheers. Kim. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Mike, I've just sent you my updated slides, mate. Okay, nice one. Thank you. Um, I am. I'm on the golf course tomorrow morning, so um, I'm <laughs> not doing any rugby for a few hours. Well, if it's raining, it'll be a short game of golf. Uh, let me have a look well at deserved. it in the afternoon, and I'll, um, uh, and I'll give you a shout. I just altered the last one to make it more to make it applicable to five five players within the grid, um, but I think the rest can be. It, it's just a little bit of common sense as to how they sort it. Um, 
So yeah, hopefully that's enough for me.